This webisode of Waterways is brought to you by Yamaha. Yamaha revs your heart. Boat Blurb, inspired boating content. Become a subscriber today. And St. Clair Boat Sales, turning boaters' dreams into reality. The temperature's rising, you're feeling the heat. Oh, you will want it to be. Summer, the summer, the summer of you. Do all the things you want to do. The summer, the summer, the summer of you. Welcome to Waterways. This week, we're starting with exclusive access to this thing, which means we can only be coming to you from one place. This is the Peterborough Lift Block, and this is what I like to call my Trent Severn Waterway Encyclopedia. Now, officially, his title is Manager of Canal Operations. Chad Buckner, how are you, buddy? Hey, it's great to be back, Steve. <laughs> great to see you again. And where else do you get an introduction like that? Right? <laughs> so, uh, this thing. This is the world's highest hydraulic lift lock right here in Peterborough, Ontario. Local hands built this thing. Local hands thought of it, put everything together, and now, while us local people in Peterborough find such a pride and a passion in this, now people from around the world come here to experience this structure, still modern in its day today, but built well over 100 years ago. The challenge in this lock station here is the lift. It's 65 feet. So to do the normal conventional seven foot high lock chambers to where in which they were building them back in the 1800s, it would have taken the average boater probably three hours to go through this site. So they made the investment to go to a much more advanced system. We could do it much quicker and easier with the lift lock here. So the basic operating principle on this is that chamber here, it has an extra foot of water in it. So it's really the world's largest teeter-totter. So that extra foot of water inside that chamber adds 144 additional tons to the weight of that. Those chambers themselves, they're balancing and floating in water. So as our team members directly above open up what we call the crossover valve, it takes the heavier chamber here the weight of that chamber is pressing down. All the water that is floating that machine up goes through a pipe, a 12-inch pipe, to the other side, and then what becomes heavier will naturally fall, and the lighter chamber will naturally rise. Here we are now today, and it's still operating in the exact same way that was intended to design, and now moving over 3,000 boats a year on an annual basis. It's pretty spectacular. Chad opened the doors to give me behind the scenes access, which as a history nerd, was pretty special. For example, I learned that that tower with the flag on top right in the middle wasn't just for decoration originally. There, that's where they used to operate the lock out of. So the old lock master, until we modernized the actual lock, used to operate out of that floor directly above us in a giant pulley system. And directly underneath you is the 12 inch pipe that connects the two lock chambers. And this is something not many people see. You can see the genius of the design. Clearly some sort of prison system or perhaps a zoo was uh, integrated. No? No, I was no, like, no. <laughs> just not it even close. Um, let me take care of the facts in here. But you know what? This is a massive 80 foot concrete wall with some pretty cool stuff behind the scenes. Let me take you in and show you. Do you have a smaller door for me to get through? <laughs> When will they build a lift lock for the Husky gentleman? <laughs> so now that we're behind the scenes in your so-called jail cell, let me tell you what this machine is actually really intended to do. So naturally water will leak, especially one the size of ours. So these water pumps take the water from the upstream side, force it back underneath to where we have an accumulator valve that will always ensure that we have the perfect balance of water holding up our chambers in the air. So not original, but this is that modern like safety redundancy that while I am impressed that a 1904 structure machine's still working, I want 2022 safety checks. So thank you. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Whoa. And here we are, buddy, with 
over 1,030,000 liters of water suspended 65 feet above our heads. All right, Steve, I really need some redemption here from your petting zoo jail joke. I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, well, we got the big ram here floating on water. Right there, you can see the steering wheel and that blue valvey dealy wheelie. That's the crossover, so right, that's where all the water goes through. And that, when that val crossover valve gets shut, there's no movement, because it holds it. How'd I do? Pretty good. Actually, I'm very impressed right now. And here we are, Steve. This is the seven and a half foot or diameter ram, 52 bolts all the way aside that holds that lock chamber high in the air. And 65 feet there, 75 feet straight down there. Under it. Yeah, right there. <laughs> you would change my shorts. Hey, you said it's not a jail. Explain these chains. <laughs> now that I crushed that crossover valve, I feel yeah. confident in telling you you got a bit of a leak here, pal. I don't want to get that looked at. Well, really, when all things are considered, Steve, considering this gate is holding back all the water from here to Peterborough, I think we can accept that little bit of leakage. This lock itself was built with an aqueduct system. So again, ex considering it's concrete surrounded by water, um, it was an aqueduct system that is built to take all of the access water and then it pumps it back in directly downstream so that water can head back into Peterborough. Cool. Later in the show, the exclusive access goes up a notch and Chad lets me help operate this engineering marvel. Press this button here, and you can tell the boats to enter into the lock. Welcome to the Peterborough Lift Lock. Go ahead and enter safely and listen to Zach, the lock master, on where exactly to go. Nailed it. My name is Gaurav Shinde, um, and I'm sailing the Golden Globe race, a solo non-stop round the world on assisted circumnavigation of the world without any modern navigation technology. There was a lot of crazy detail in there, but yes, you heard it right. Non-stop, single-handed circumnavigation without any modern navigational technology. And right now we are in my boat, which is uh, getting prepared for that race. My boat is a 1980 Bawa 35 named Good Hope. Gaurav sets off tomorrow and he let me get in the way as he and a friend did some last minute work before he leaves Port Credit, Ontario en route to France for the start of the race in September. It's just the third time this race has been held and a lack of modern technology allowed and limitation to a hull length of 32 to 36 feet is to replicate what Sir Robin Knox Johnston used when he became the first man to achieve the solo circumnavigation feat in 1969. I've been sailing for 23, 24 years now. Uh, 24 years now, I grew up in Bombay, uh, Mumbai. Uh, and I joined the Sea Cadets over there. Uh, that's where I learned sailing. I grew up from the Opti, Optimus class, and then uh, going to 420s and uh, 470s and then bigger boats. Um, and that's been my life. And I did a lot of offshore sailing. In India, the offshore sailing was happening on 20-foot open dinghies. Uh, and I did that, um, sail across the Arabian Sea a few times. Uh, and uh, that was fun. Uh, and then I did uh, the clip around the world yacht race, which was a big experience uh, of uh, high seas uh, and crossing an ocean uh, on a sailboat, uh, on a fast sailboat. This one won't be particularly fast. He expects the circumnavigation to take 235 days, but hopefully there will be some of this high octane sailboat fuel when he casts off. And I'll give you updates on his progress in later shows. All right, Steve, the time that you're, you've always been waiting for. Good Come across. gravy, that's high. Keep one hand on the railing at all times. Three Where's weeks. the fella go for clean shorts after this tour? <laughs> Jeez. To the brains of the operation. Oh, Zach? Oh, no, not Zach, the lock master, but I mean the control panel. But here's Zach, our lock master. Nice to meet you. Sweet video game. All those buttons are neat, but I do love me a microphone. Welcome to the Peterborough lift lock. Go ahead and enter safely. And Aside from just the guiding them in, I felt dishing out some attaboys was key to a good lockage. So all three of you put on a clinic just now. Well done, <laughs> captains. 
All right, so the gate's open, Steve. I think it's time to close the gate. You did a good job on loading the three boats. You can close the gate now. There's one. Not that button. Not, not funny. Not funny. Come on. <laughs> yes, you can close. You can use that button. This one. Yes. <laughs> So now that the lock is fully in operation, Steve, as you can see, the upper chamber here has an extra 144 tons. The lighter chamber, it doesn't matter how many boats we have on this side, the boats will displace their weight as they're locking. From the moment you hit the down button, it's 90 seconds from start to finish during the entire operating sequence. Buddy, unbelievable tour. Thank you so much. I hope the people watching this enjoyed it as much as I loved being here and shooting it. This is super cool. Steve, you did a great job today. You did awesome work on some of your facts, not all of them, but most of them were on point. But most importantly, I was very impressed with your operability. And um, for the next Lockmaster vacancy, throw a resume in. You have a shot. Yeah. You have a shot. I told you, Mom, I'm employable. <laughs>to pick up the ramp to get out. So um, just a really weird transmission system, kind of cool. I guess it can't take huge waves, right? So we're not crossing Lake Ontario today. We'll stick in this section of the Trent Severn. Don't <laughs> worry, New York, we'll see you another day. <laughs> I am excited. All right, let's do this thing. <laughs> Onward. <laughs> So how often do you take this out? Well, I like to take it out about three times a year, roughly. One of the biggest days is, is Canada Day. We go out towards Lakefield area, and then we have fun just taking people for rides and putting around and just taking some pictures, having some fun. 43 horsepower. Listen to that baby purr. It's a powerhouse. You know what I said? Let's drive to the lift lock. I meant, like, Oh, you want to go in? <laughs> you actually want to take the car in the water? It's an amphi car. I've seen the car part. <laughs> I want the amphi part. Oh, OK, well, let's do it. I don't have the words to describe how excited I am for this part. Well, it feels like you're going to continue to go straight down into the water, and all of a sudden, <laughs> it pops up. Wait for it. <laughs> there it is. We're in. We are in. We are in the canal. I saw the props. How, how are you steering? <laughs> well, the rudders are your front tires, sir. No And way. we use the steering wheel to move ourselves left and right, which is, as they call it, a bad boat and a bad car, all in one. <laughs> <laughs> Man, these traffic jams, eh? <laughs> My gosh. What is that? Hey, Chad! Steve? 3,000 boats and one car, fella. Is that one of those amphibious cars? Update your stats. You heard it here first. The Trent Severn Waterway now takes amphibious cars. We opted not to go up the lift lock, and John relinquished controls which gave me a good chance to ask a very important question. How do you even get into this sort of thing? 35 years ago, I went into the Toronto International Boat Show, and the Trent Severn Antique Classic Boat Club was the first uh, display as you come in the door. 
and I just went in to look at the lovely wooden boats and I looked over in the corner and there was this guy sitting there with a car. And I went over and I said, what is this, mister? He said, this here is an amphi car. It floats. I said, you gotta be kidding. He said, no, no, it's a car and it, it goes in the water. And I thought, someday I have to have one of those, those vehicles. And here we are. We're, uh, we're out cruising the Trent Severn Waterway. It's fantastic. Hi folks, great job in the life jackets. Beautiful day on Lake Kuchiching. Sergeant Dave Moffat, how are you? Good buddy, how are you? Living the dream. Excellent. OPP Marine Unit, don't believe me, I talk about safety, these guys see it. Oh, life jackets, I've seen you thanking people as we pass by, why is this so important? It is, it is absolutely crucial that people wear their life jackets. In the last 11 years, we've lost 260 people in marine related deaths, and 84% of those people are, weren't wearing life jackets. So, you know, those, those numbers would change drastically if people just put on a life jacket and wear something that's comfortable. Inflatable life jackets are the way to go. You got all the options now. It's like, uh, for me, it's like a seatbelt. If I don't have it on, it, it feels that's right. odd. Yeah, absolutely. All right, close at hand isn't close enough. On is what we need, right? That's right, yeah. Make sure you put it on. Don't put it beside you. It does nothing if it's beside you. Well, I like this one that says police. I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> Thanks for this, by the way. <laughs> I'm striking out fishing, but there is a local from Peterborough, Chris Johnston, who is a professional. And to catch up with him, I had to go a little further south. Check this out. This is the Bassmaster Classic, a massive fishing tournament that crowns the world champion of bass fishing. And it's a way bigger deal than you probably think it is. Total prize money? One million dollars. It's a three-day spectacle that's broadcast nationally and draws thousands of spectators for the launch and the weigh-in. 55 anglers earn the right to compete here and it's a five fish per day limit. You can catch a hundred, but you can only keep and weigh five. So how do you watch the actual fishing action? Well, you can see behind me, there's traffic on this highway. It was a bit of an offshoot here. So what the spectators have to do is drive around Lake Hartwell, post up somewhere like this, and hope that their favorite angler happens to consider this a bit of a honey hole. So we're gonna stick this out because if you ask me, this is bass country right here. It turns out I was right. It didn't take long before the pros showed up here. You're also allowed to follow them around on the lake in your own boat, as long as you keep a respectful distance. At the end of the day, it's coordinated chaos as all the anglers have to haul out and drive 40 miles from Anderson to Greenville, where a hockey arena is packed for the weigh-in. But I met a super fan who found the best seat in the house. Actually, it wasn't even a seat, and it wasn't really in the house either. So, do you think you want to be a professional angler? Is that something you like it that much? Yes, sir. What What's so great about fishing for you? What What do you like it so? Much? The boats. Boats. And having fun. Yeah, and I dig the it. Dream. Yes, buddy. I love it. Only the top five finishers the first two days get to compete on Championship Sunday, including this guy. That's Peterborough's Chris Johnston. At the moment, he's far from the top, but anything can happen if the fish cooperate. This is it, the final weigh-in championship Sunday. Only 25 anglers made this final cut, and the winner is walking home with $300,000. Before we get there, though, there's a lot of fun, there's a lot of excitement, and there's even giveaways and t-shirt tosses for the fans, for the fans in the stands. What that is? It's a free t-shirt. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> Ahead of the final weigh-in, everything seems up a notch. The crowd's buzzing, the anglers are pumped, and the bass, even they seem bigger. But with only six to go, Johnston finds himself in first place. 
it's a whole different world down here, to be honest. And you can you can follow your dream and uh, make a living chasing these bass. And uh, it's really cool that I got to set an example for some of our Canadian anglers. And there's going to be a few more of them coming down here in the next couple years, I'm sure. Four of the six that still needed to be weighed topped him, so he finished fifth. Still a solid showing. This man, Jason Christie from Oklahoma, bested the pro from Peterborough and the rest of the pack to nab the 52nd Bassmaster Classic title and the $300,000 first prize. I managed to catch up with Johnston afterwards, just after the press conference for the top five finishers. Yes, a press conference for fishing. I'm telling you, this is huge and it's awesome. There's a lot of tournaments, but there's only one classic. How is this compared to any other? What, is, what would the next closest even be? Is there, there is, anything? There is, there is nothing like this. I, I can promise you that. Um, yeah, just even at takeoff in the morning, there, I don't even know how many people are there, but it's packed to, to watch boats idle out and take off in the morning. It's pretty incredible. And then this arena was jammed this afternoon and it's, it's nice to see. It's great for fishing. So what's next? Uh, I got about five days off. I'm going to go to Canada and see my boys and then uh, back to South Carolina for the next tournament. That's it. It's over. Jason Christie is $300,000 richer. I am hooked on bass fishing. And now all that's left is hit me with your confetti. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's impressive. And I just can't help but think about the, the pitch. RV Rogers showed up and was like, hey, Here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> Forget that flight lock thing. I'm gonna do this. The land transmission, you have to have it in now in the gear because okay. once we come up to the, the launch ramp, we need to catch with our land transmission to thrust us out. <laughs> yes, that's just as good. Just that easy. Here today. Right. We got it right there, boys. Yeah, buddy. We haven't even started the weigh-in. I don't know what they said. I'm just so excited. The Yamaha VMAX SHO.